Hi guys, I'm Shmi. Hello and welcome back to the channel where you join me this afternoon at Speedy Jeff's Man Cave, where surrounding me we have some incredible cars, including five Koenigsegg Agira RSs and the final editions. But today we're actually going to be taking a look at something that over here in the US is even rarer, and that is this. Danamai's Aston Martin Lagonda Taraf. Now they made 120 of them in total, but we believe this might be the only one here in the USA in the entirety of the United States. Now this was the $1 million Aston Martin saloon car. At the time, it was the most expensive production four-door car in the world. Today, Dan has very kindly allowed me to take a look at the car and also to take it out for a drive to see what it's all about. So let's do this then and check out the Aston Martin Lagonda Taraf. Before we go through all of the details then of the Lagonda Taraf and have a look at what is arguably the most luxurious interior ever in an Aston Martin to date, we are of course setting off here from Speedy Jeff's magnificent man cave. Behind me, we've got six Koenigseggs in total. There are also two Paganis, both Huayra BCs, one just here, another of the 20 in total there at the back. We've got a Koenigsegg CCX currently undergoing some upgrades, hence why it doesn't have the front and rear clams, but we've got three of the 25 Agera RSs, the Phoenix, the Valhall, and the Draken, which Dan and I also very kindly allowed me to drive as well. We've also got the two final editions, Thor just there, and Vader over the other side, alongside one of the 10 MSO Xs from McLaren. But we're gonna be heading from here over also to Dan and I's garage, where we're gonna be greeted very shortly by even more hypercars. We are talking Pagani's, a Centenario, a Senna, and plenty more later on. So this car then, a car that is particularly intriguing to me it's a bit of a unicorn you rarely if ever see them the original intention when the car was first shown was to create a hundred units that were only going to be available to the Middle East region when Andy Palmer took over as CEO of Aston Martin that number was upped to a potential 200 available more globally including the US and Europe and a few other markets in total though only 120 were actually ever produced but there's quite a story that goes back behind it and also behind the Lagonda name. So Lagonda was first founded back in 1909. They had successes in the 1930s, including winning the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1935. Then in 1939, the Lagonda Rapide V12 was actually the most expensive car available on sale here in the USA. When World War II broke out, it wasn't quite such a period of success for the company, and in 1947, they were bought by David Brown, who also owned Aston Martin, hence the combining of the two companies company names as you've seen it in more recent decades. So the previous generation Aston Martin Lagonda was a car that ran for quite a period through the 70s and the 80s and this in 2009 on the 100th anniversary of Lagonda was shown as a concept for what could happen next. The decision was made to put the car into production and this is the one we see and like I said there might only be one if not perhaps two in total here in the USA. It was a car that when launched came in just shy of a million dollars. A very very expensive car the most expensive car with four doors. It's based on an extended version of the DB9 and the Rapid platform. So that means up front, you've got the six liter naturally aspirated V12 that makes 560 horsepower. You also have the eight speed ZF gearbox, but the design and styling is very different from that of other Aston Martins. It's intended to be an even higher level of luxury. And going forwards, Lagonda is the brand that Aston Martin are now using for their more electric vehicles, their more luxurious end of the product range. So around the front you have a distinctly Aston Martin grille but with a difference the way that it integrates in towards the headlights. One at the front you have the Lagonda badge as opposed to the Aston Martin badge. This car in a very dark metallic grey paintwork but sharing some similarities you've got the dual tone the diamond turned wheels. If we come and have a look now at the interior just feast your eyes at this the windows actually drop quite far as you open them but pillarless windows and check out in here. Systems and controls familiar from Aston Martin the likes of the steering wheel the dashboard the waterfall central console but with new leathers new materials a product of Aston Martin's Q branch the Q division where they do additional personalization but the biggest change compared to say the Rapide is of course when it comes to the rear of the car back here having much more space and much more in terms of the qualities and luxuriousness to be driven around and to use perhaps as a chauffeur vehicle. Now, despite its size, it doesn't actually have that much space available in the trunk. But the design at the rear, again, quite different. This chrome strip that runs all the way around the back 
but an overall clean design, a very formal, very smart design. That's exactly what they were going for. So let me just close this, give the door a proper shut. I've got the key in my pocket, which is the key of the era for Aston Martin, the emotional control unit, but in this case, with Lagonda inside the crystal at the end. I'll take a step inside here, just to bring it quickly into life. Only 300 miles on the clock of this car. So we'll pop that in and then in a second, give it a full press so that you can hear it coming into life. Into life it goes. So a softer sound than perhaps in the Rapide. Now that lineup is pretty cool, but we should get on the road and head over then to the other location, to Dan's garage to see what's over there. And in the meantime, that means driving in this. And of course, like an Aston Martin, you've got your seat controls down uh, on the central tunnel. You've got this waterfall uh, column where you have park, reverse, neutral and drive. So obviously D into drive and start off with some fuel on the way. The car is low at the moment. You actually have an electronic handbrake. Normally Aston's have a fly-off handbrake down in the, uh, the footwell. Of course, this is a bit different. We've got sport mode selected just here. We've also got sport dampers. I'm gonna soften those up to adapt to damping normal. Uh, maybe we'll start out of sport mode and put it into sport mode after, of course, the main difference being the exhaust noise. So we are in drive. Let's head on out then and get a feel for what this is like. So farewell to all of the cars here for the moment. We will be back. And away we go then. The car filled up. We got cut off at 20 gallons. So it's a pretty big fuel tank. But the immediate thing you notice is that in the normal quiet mode, it is very quiet and peaceful in here. Clearly the sound deadening from thicker glass windows. They actually tried to keep the weight of the car down despite having a six litre lump up front and also of course having all of the leathers and fine materials inside. So the bodywork is all CFRP, carbon fiber reinforced plastic. We're basically just cruising along in a distinctly familiar car to me. Uh, I owned a Vanquish which was based on the similar platform um, and have spent a lot of time in different Aston Martin models of all sorts. So the engine by the way, I think I might have said 560 earlier but it's 540 horsepower in total. Um, not exactly a shortage for this kind of car, a car to cruise around in. If I press sport, things do actually become instantly louder. You can go into manual with the paddles. Just drop down a few bits here. A little bit of the V12, but it's a very different character from the Rapide. It's a very, very, very different character actually. That's really interesting how much it differs. So like other Astons, you know, you'll get decent speed out of it. It will accelerate more than briskly enough. That's not necessarily what this car is for. It's for cruising along. And doing what we're doing right now, just press D again to go back into drive and you know, chill on these kind of roads. It does a really nice job. Does it do a million dollars a job? That's a very different question. I mean, one of one technically here in the US, that's quite special, but it feels very similar to a Rapid overall when you're sitting inside it. In terms of seating position, in terms of comfort, in terms of what you're looking at and what you're feeling, it's the rarity and exclusivity value, I guess, that gives it that price tag. Just to test, let's put it into adaptive damping sport and see what differences we can feel. I'm gonna go back into manual actually, just drop down some gears. We're heading out onto the highway. So the car, I mean, 540 horsepower at 630 newton meters. And actually, just to give you some real numbers, top speed, 195 miles per hour, 314 kilometers an hour. And the 0 to 62 mile an hour sprint, 100 kilometer an hour sprint, is done in just 4.4 seconds. So very quick, like I said. Let's see though, as we pull away from the traffic light here, if we're gonna be able to get any nice sounds out of this car. Can we get a moment? In just a second, do we go? Yeah, we can go. quiet actually. That's fascinating. The character is so different from the Rapide. Clearly the setup, the dampers you can feel, all configured to be more like a Rolls Royce than an Aston Martin, if I can say it that way. It's that kind of gentleness in how it's going about it. I'm not sure what I think about this. I love that it exists. I really like these cars that are different. And this car, when it was launched, encouraged a lot of conversation. Lots of people obviously did not like how it looks. It's very different. It's it's quite discreet, actually, particularly in this color scheme. The interior is fantastic. The dual tone that you have inside here, the light finish for the leather is very, very nice. The dashboard, the piano black you have up through the center. But I'm not gonna lie, it does start to look a little bit dated. Remember, the concept was shown, like I said, in 2009. The car was shown in 2014, and they ceased production in December 2015. So the car is about four or five years old in terms of when it started production, but the platform on which it's based, the original DB9 platform, well, that was about 2004. So 
things have moved on quite a bit since and I think the car has or suffered a little bit because of that. So clearly Aston Martin, you know, they wanted to sell 200, they didn't manage to sell 200. I'm not sure what these trade for on the market. I mean, this being one of one in the US, that will certainly help it, uh, as opposed to the cars of which, you know, over in Europe or the Middle East or something where there are more of them. Aston Martin definitely used the car as a bit of a tool uh, in connection to some of their hypercars, encouraging their customers to purchase these as well, uh, which helped with some of the sales. But it's a funny one. I, I, I struggle to see where it's directly worth its price tag. I mean, I like things that are different and out there, but in this case, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm really struggling with it. California T, Tesla Model 3. There are Teslas absolutely everywhere around here, but it is genuinely fascinating how much that this car is so much like a chilled out Rapide. I've been trying to get some sound out of it and really and truly, it is very, very quiet, which makes sense for this world of luxury. I mean, the car was pitched at being, you know, a luxurious car to go in the Middle East, to go with other Aston Martin models, the hypercars coming out, for example. And if you think about it also opening it up to different markets, that's, it's serving that niche as well, but it is very much a small niche. This is such a car that you have to be so keenly enthused for what this offers to want to go for it as a Lagonda. I'm looking forward to what the future of Lagonda is going to be, but check out this view down towards the Newport coast here in the Orange County, SoCal, Southern California, south of Los Angeles. It is a spectacular place. And to be honest, I'm enjoying cruising in this, just driving here. I think they made them in both left-hand and left-hand drive and right-hand drive. Of course, being a US market car, this is left-hand drive. But yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying the drive, but I'm struggling still to come to complete terms with it. And yeah. Ah, uh, it's a difficult one. Down towards the coast then. Coast Highway as it's called. I mean, it is very gentle, you know, even on the brakes, the gearbox is clearly programmed to be smooth and easy. Good stopping power despite the car's weight. I mean, like I said, they tried to make it lightweight, but it's still a heavy car. You've still got a big lump up front. There are some controls that are a bit funny. Have a look at this. We've got our cooled seats turned on at the moment. Um, so you've got this toggle that basically you select from left seat to right seat, you can see it illuminating. And then you can go through hot and cold. You get the different lights uh, shining up. You got the button to open the boot or the trunk out here, your parking sensors, um, rear AC control to make it independent, electric handbrake. You've got a cigarette um, ashtray thing here. I guess you can lift this out, yeah. And then you've got the leather lined cup holder. Again, all of these details are all very nice and smart. And you know, you've got a system here, the entertainment screen will open up if you press a button, I, I, there are various different ways you can get that to, to load up and unfold um, to make it come up and then you've got different, I if press now, there we go, it unfolds up, Aston Martin style and uh, get that, yeah, you know, I mean it's a previous generation system really, it's not the latest and greatest by any stretch of the imagination, that also shows the reversing camera, which by the way, if I just put it into reverse, that's not very good quality, I'm not sure if you can see it but the resolution is very, very low for a modern era camera system. Um, now it's when we want the parking sensors off because they beep away. Steering wheel, people tell me this about my GT8 as well. It's a little bit dated. I mean, it's what it was. It's got a Lagonda badge instead of the Aston Martin wings and cruise control on it and some buttons on the back, but it's not the you know, latest generation. The steering wheel has actually got quite a thin um, surround. Once it kind of makes you want to drive it, you know, Rolls Royce style, gently, easily, quietly. And that's what it does and it does do that really well it has to be said this is the moment then arriving at the garage and this is the place that dreams are made of because inside here have a quick little look cinque cinque tricolore centenario senna and we're pulling in in a lagonda Terra. this is absolutely incredible what an amazing lineup so park, close the windows. With this car, he says, that would be the rear windows. It would help if I press the right buttons. I'm gonna turn it off. And that's that. Our ride 
in the Lagonda Taraf. Let's hop on and show you a little bit more around the car. Well, what a sight to behold in Dan's fantastic garage here. The two matching exposed carbon fiber with blue accent specifications worn by the McLaren Senna and the Lamborghini Centenario Coupe, one of only 20, and then the three Paganis. Each one an incredibly limited edition, one of only three Tricolores in total, and then the two Cinques, each one of five, the yellow Roadster and the green Coupe. But of course, also part of the collection is the Lagonda Taraf. And as I've experienced it today, this is so much a car that feels more positioned to be driven in as opposed to drive yourself, to be used as a chauffeur car. So let me show you more of the rear and also the space up in the back because that's actually quite curious. But in the back of the car, like the Rapide, but with so much more room, the Rapide was always a bit of a struggle. So you do have the traditional Aston Martin doors back here, the swan doors with those grab handles uh, for the door handles, the swan doors that open ever so slightly upwards. And then with the driver's seat still in my position from driving, you do have plenty of space ample legroom you'll see here plenty of comfort and, and room and you have this bracket mounted on the back of the seat in front which is to hold an ipad mini hasn't been set up yet for this car but it is uh, provided with it you've got a great view through but the fit and finish and quality of materials is all brilliant up through the headliner and the finish you have up there you've also got the controls here for the climate control in the back everything the door handles nicely designed around here too the seats have the perforation the lagonda stitching and embroidery and if i just pull down the armrest this actually has a soft mechanism to it so it sits itself all the way down you've got the leather linings around the inside of the cup holders and the padded armrest too let's close that back up so overall inside back here it's actually a quite nice place to be sat with a great view through towards the front particularly now with those cars in sight of us up front so let me step on out then and show you inside trunk of the car. It's slightly awkward still because you do have to step around the wheel arch, which is what you had with the Rapide as well. The body has some nice crease lines, these shapes that you can see. But inside the trunk, as they would say out here, the boot for us, let me just take the key and give that a pop to open it up. It's not exactly that much space considering the size of the actual car. You've got the headsets here, the iPads as well, but it's a quite awkward shape. It does go in and under the back parcel shelf, but there's not a whole lot of room. You've got a leather grab handle here to pull it down down, but you can't really give it the swing. You do have to kind of catch it on top and then press it down where it does have soft clothes at the back. Overall though, look at the car. It stands out, it's unique, it's distinct. It's traveled us today from one collection with Speedy Jeff here to Danamai's garage. And it's done that in a very nice way. It has to be said, an effortless cruiser, a lovely car. It has all the talk of the V12. It has all the qualities of an Aston Martin, but it's certainly at the very keen end in terms of pricing. I think it was about a million dollars a couple of years ago. The exchange rate from pounds to dollars has dropped and declined significantly against my favor since then, of course. So it might've been about half a million pounds or something like that at the time, plus taxes, six, 700,000, that kind of thing. So definitely at the steep end, but certainly quite a unicorn, a car I've been hoping to film something with, but never really thought that might be possible. So it's a huge thanks to Dan Amai that it's been possible today to shoot with this. And I hope you've enjoyed the video, learnt something about the car and seen some of the amazing cars in the two collections that we visited as well. But that's it for today. Thank you very much as always guys. And I'll catch up with you again very soon. Cheers.